Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to begin a new series of videos on the introduction to Sikh philosophy. I will be examining as many texts over the topic as I can get a hold of over the coming months. I'd like to begin the discussion now with an analysis of the short book Philosophy and Faith of Sikhism by K.S. Dugal. This is a response to a patron's request within the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts are in the video description. Also begin with the disclaimer that this video really is my attempt to learn about Sikhism for the first time. I'm doing this as an American originally, and as someone who does not speak the Punjabi language, and is still only in the earliest phases of learning Sanskrit. So in this video, I'm not intending to make any dogmatic assertion that anything said about Sikhism, or any other religion for that matter, definitely is the case. Instead, I am simply seeking to pose some questions in order to further the discussion so that over time I might gain a better understanding of the Sikh religion and philosophy. In addition, I make clear from the start now that nothing said about Sikhism or any other religion in these videos is my own belief or opinion. They're simply a way to stimulate discussion so that over time I can learn more about one of the world's great religions. So before getting into the text itself, it bears mentioning that the main difficulty in trying to study Sikh philosophy for the first time especially is that the most important texts about the religion tend to belong to the literary genre of religious hymns rather than the sort of Western-style philosophical treatises which you might otherwise expect. The religious and poetic nature of these hymns can only be fully appreciated in the original languages in which they are written, and by that I really do mean languages in the plural, as the Holy Granth, for example, is written in not just one but various dialects of Punjabi, as well as having parts in Sanskrit and Persian. Yet, even if a Westerner did attempt to learn these languages by, say, memorizing the textbook meaning of various terms, another difficulty would still remain as one of my Sikh friends who lives in the Punjab region here in India um, recently revealed to me, the same word Hari, for example, can have 17 different meanings in the same Sikh hymn, depending on context. So it pretty much goes without saying that someone like me is completely dependent upon an introduction to the religion, which is not only written in English, uh, but in the case of the book I will discuss in this video, uh, was even written within America itself. After acquiring several texts, I decided to begin the series with an overview of Philosophy and Faith of Sikhism by K.S. Dugal, published in 1982 by the Himalayan International Institute of Yoga Science and Philosophy of the USA, apparently located in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. However, it would be closer to the truth to say that the book was really authored by both K.S. Dugal and another person named Swami Rama, given that the latter actually supplies the most philosophically interesting information about Sikhism in a relatively lengthy foreword at the beginning of the text. In Swami Rama's foreword to the book, we find that one useful way to begin to understand Sikhism is to consider how it differs from Hinduism. Because Guru Nanak, the founder of the religion, was born to Hindu parents in the Punjab region near present-day Lahore, we might consider Sikhism to be a reformation of the founder's original religion in much the same way that the Christianity of Paul might be considered a reformation of the ancient Jewish religion which he had been born into and had before enthusiastically practiced. Things which Guru Nanak criticized within Hinduism, as we shall see in greater detail, include the alleged idolatry, ritualism, caste system, and quasi-polytheistic nature of at least the version of the religion which he was exposed to while growing up. In addition to criticizing such religious practices, though, he also extended his criticism to certain social rules within the religion, such as the wandering ascetic and the abstract philosophizer. Although these figures had traditionally been revered, their activities were found by the guru to contradict his own ethical ideals, given the fact that Sikhism's emphasis on the oneness of God 
necessarily transfers over to an understanding of the human community as a social unity defined by love, equality, and an ethical call to fulfill one's duties to others. It was exactly the latter which he faulted the ascetic and philosopher for failing to live up to. But this emphasis on the oneness of God can be observed in the Sikh scriptures as early as the Mul Mantra, which opens the Holy Granth, and therefore is worth quoting in full before we begin discussing any other topics within Sikh philosophy, because this will make everything else much easier to understand. The Mul Mantra, opening the Holy Granth, reads, There is but one God. His name is Truth. He is the Creator. He fears none, nor does he hate anyone. He is in the image of the Eternal. He is beyond birth and death. He is self-existent. He can be attained by the Guru's grace. With this idea of the oneness of God in mind is really the central belief of Sikhism, if I may dare to say so, uh, let us now consider the alleged Sikh criticisms of Hindu practices in greater detail. One difference between Sikh and Hindu faiths is that Sikhism downplays the role of the religious ascetic. The Indian religious ascetic is the kind of person who would stereotypically smear himself with ashes and then wander through forests and along riverbanks in order to perform various mortifications of the flesh. Such a person would survive through begging from strangers, who would uh, implicitly contribute a tithe to fund the ascetic's attempt to transcend the lower material world in order to reach the higher spiritual realm. Admirable as this image has traditionally seemed to be, its underlying motive is, from the standpoint of Sikhism, inherently questionable, because in practical terms, the ascetics attempt to renounce the concerns of the material world in favor of those of the spiritual world misses the point that such a person will, in reality, still continue to be dependent on the same material needs which they claim to reject. For example, such a person will still have to eat but they'll survive by taking food from the community in one way or another, without, however, fulfilling their ethical duties to the community in return, given that such a person will have had to drop out of the social ecosystem by leaving behind their role as a householder in charge of a family or a worker within the local economy in order to live such a lifestyle. The deeper metaphysical problem, though, lies in the very idea that any such dualism between a fallen material world on one hand and a truer spiritual one beyond it on the other could exist. For such an idea negates the Sikh belief in God as a oneness, which is paradoxically both beyond body, senses, breath, and mind, to quote from the text itself, and yet is inclusive of all of those things, too in that God in this context might be understood to be present in all things because he is himself synonymous with the notion of the all. There is no need to suspend one's involvement in this material world in order to try to reach God in some mystical realm beyond, for the oneness of God reveals this material world, which we are already in, to be the locus in which God can be found because, more specifically, Specifically, this is the realm in which God has to be realized through our own ethical actions. These acts are done not for the sake of our own self-interests, but rather for the sake of the broader human community of which we're always a smaller part, even if we violate both of these rules as the religious ascetic allegedly does by separating himself from the social oneness in order to embark on a futile attempt to escape from the metaphysical oneness by positing a true world beyond the supposedly false world he's already in. This oneness of God also forms the basis for another Sikh reformation, which is the Guru's criticism of the use of idols. Although Hindus do not literally worship idols as some falsely claim, but instead use them as hermeneutical supplements to help focus the wandering mind on some fixed representation of God. Sikhs allegedly argue that the very need for such idols will vanish if one realizes that the radical oneness of God will always escape any idol's attempt to fix him 
within the kind of representational limits which could be contained in a statue or a picture. Another social role criticized in Sikhism is that of the abstract philosophizer, because excessively abstract philosophizing only negates the ideal of God's oneness and of the material world as the sphere for ethical action. This is because the abstract philosophizer's speculations on obscure metaphysical pseudo-problems only ends up feeding into artificially enlarging that same individual thinker's ego, under the worst conditions, merely serving as a surrogate activity, as Ted Kaczynski would call it, to make one feel so much smarter than everyone else, without, however, getting any closer to the ultimate truth as a result of that activity. This inflation of the ego might seem to liberate that person to reach higher truths than other lesser thinkers could ever have imagined, but in reality, this vain intellectual activity only creates unnecessary barriers between that person and the real enlightenment, which, from the standpoint of Sikhism, would have to consist in the realization of the oneness of God through one's ethical action within the human community. This oneness is inherently negated by the separation of one individual mind into a self-imposed imprisonment in ever more tortuous mazes of abstraction which the mind erects for the perverse goal of getting lost in its own puzzles of thought, in the process breaking away from God and community in an even more radical manner than the ascetic had done. These examples prove that for the Sikh, the material world is not an illusion in the sense of the traditional term maya, nor is it a temptation leading us into sin, as Roman Catholicism more or less claims. Instead, the material world is the realm in which ethical action must take place, because one's goal here is nothing short of the realization of the divine presence in this world. This takes place by means of the two Sikh virtues of love and the grace of the true guru, which in this context is understood to mean that which dispels ignorance and darkness. Similarly, Sikhs tend to downplay the rigid ritualism of at least some interpretations of Hinduism, with the belief that formulaically performing old established rituals will not lead one any closer to God, but will instead feed into the irrelevant pathological demand to create a public spectacle, while reinforcing questionable social class distinctions through creating a dependency on the human figure of the priest, rather than satisfy the goal of actually realizing the divine presence within the world through egalitarian communal love. This is because the ritual presupposes a social relation in which one relies on the priest to do something which ultimately one must do for oneself, which is achieving unity with God. In Sikhism, this unity is achieved not through faithfully repeating old ceremonial procedures which had been handed down from a long time ago, but is instead realized through practically living out the virtues of love and enlightenment for oneself here and now. The main problem with such ritualism is that it requires one side of the social relation to enter into and to remain in a totally passive state, in stark contrast with the Sikh ideal of practical action in the real world, such as serving one's duty to head a household or to perform one's daily work in the local economy. Sikhism's emphasis on the real oneness of God is be taken so literally that death itself can eventually be seen as an occasion for joy, rather than the worst bad thing to be feared. One can only reach such a state of embracing death if one realizes it to be an occasion for the divine wedding of the soul to God. According to this book, the most important practice for preparing the soul for that moment of union with God, which is mistakenly called death, is the practice of assimilating the name of God, which in Sikhism is Wahe Guru, or the combination of the Punjabi word wahe, meaning asam, and the word guru, in this context understood to mean that which dispels the darkness and ignorance. One might argue that the darkness and ignorance 
dispelled in the revelation of God in Sikhism is the very idea that God is separate from this world, or particularly from us. Because Sikhs seek to recognize the divine presence in all humans, rather than persecute those of other belief systems as some religions had mistakenly done in the past, Sikhs always promote tolerance and in fact established the first secular state in India on just such a principle. In this context, secularism does not mean a lack of let alone an opposition to religion. Instead, secularism means a political system in which all religions are allowed to be practiced with equal freedom. Well, the first Eastern secular state in this sense was actually an empire stretching from Tibet to Sindh in which a Sikh ruler named Maharaja Ranjit Singh oversaw a population that was about 80% Muslim, 10% Hindu, and only 10% his own religion, but never practiced any form of religious discrimination whatsoever while ruling over them. Similarly, some 500 years ago, Guru Nanak allegedly rejected the social divisions not only of religion but also of caste by establishing places of worship in which anybody was free to enter. In fact, according to this book, the Guru's quote-unquote harshest criticism was toward the caste system because, unlike the Buddha, he was not from a wealthy royal family. So, the Guru had friends among the so-called low castes from the earliest days of his childhood onward. Because he was always immersed in dealing with many different quote-unquote kinds of people, he was unable to accept the idea of a rigid social class system that would separate one person from another on grounds as arbitrary as which family they had happened to have been born into. As always, the guru really put his money where his mouth was by starting the famous Sikh community kitchen in which, even to the present day, people are free to eat regardless of caste and even religion. In fact, the guru mandated that people eat with him in the community kitchen before meeting with him for any other purpose. The guru's beliefs regarding social equality were proven to be sincere when he did not choose one of his sons to be his successor, as virtually anyone else at that time would have done, but instead passed the torch to the worthiest candidate in the community. In addition to avoiding nepotism, the guru also reinforced his religious belief that no person can be thought of as inherently different from another on grounds as arbitrary as blood relation or family. The guru also rejected the kind of gender distinctions that would lead one to treat women as materialist distractions from the higher cause of spiritual enlightenment as one Roman Catholic monk in the Middle Ages suggested when he infamously warned his reader never to look any woman in the face, not even one's own mother, for fear of falling into the temptation to sin. From the Sikh perspective, blaming another person or an entire gender for one's own failure to reach God misses the point that the human community is exactly where God is to be found. In fact, the more enlightened one becomes, the more one will have to identify oneself with the feminine ideal of the bride, seeing oneself as the one who awaits union with the bridegroom who is God. Likewise, the truths of Sikhism are not just to be understood by reason, but are instead to be experienced concretely. This is because the thing which one is trying to understand, which is the ultimate truth of God is the one, is something which has to be merged with, rather than just subsumed under abstract concepts by a disconnected human mind. In practical terms, this emphasis on unity in the social realm was expressed through Sikh projects like building schools, irrigation systems, public kitchens, and homes. These investments into the well-being of the community express the Sikh belief that the love of man and the love of God are, under the right view, exactly the same thing. In ethical terms, this means that one's goals should, over time, come to be less and less self-centered and should always come to include helping more and more people beyond oneself. This emphasis on communal love rather than self-perfection has paradoxically led Sikhism to not promote the repression of natural desires, as Roman Catholicism has traditionally warned that hardwired instincts 
instincts, leading one to desire natural pleasures, are nothing more than a temptation from the devil himself. Well, according to this book, the reason for Seek's rejection of such a simplistic explanation of the phenomenon of natural desire really has to do with Sikhism's commitment to the principle of nonviolence. Sikhism favors nonviolence even in the case of one's own self, as excessive repression is indeed a form of violence. The seven Sikh virtues which make this ethical ideal into a living practice include the following. Truth in action, contentment, compassion, fearlessness, humility, non-attachment, temperance, and the cultivation of wisdom. The main difference between action in accord with these seven Sikh virtues and the ordinary non-ethical actions performed under the pathological influence of the ego is the following. Only the former, that is to say, the action in accord with the seven Sikh virtues, can break the cycle of reincarnation, while the latter, those actions done under the pathological influence of the self, will always continue to perpetuate that same cycle of birth and rebirth in different bodies. From the Eastern standpoint, this is a dreadful cycle because it will inevitably mean more suffering due to more unsatisfied desire. This can only be broken, though, according to Sikhism, through the kind of enlightenment which is not a matter of learning new information on an abstract level, but is instead a matter of really merging with the Divine One. According to this book, this merging with the one happens only when one's own action is fully subsumed under the higher divine will of God. Such an act will transcend all human standards of rational comprehension, because the entire point here is to be liberated from the narrow limits of the human ego's understanding and its pathological self-interest. The daily routine of a Sikh includes the following. One will wake, bathe, chant the japji and meditate on them, and then go to the Gurdwara for darshana. Darshana is a term from the Sanskrit root drs, which we keep in mind is not an actual word, but is instead a useful linguistic abstraction from various words with a common form. According to Michael Coulson's excellent book, Complete Sanskrit, the root drs means to see or to show, depending on context. So in philosophical terms, a darshana might be thought of as the revelation of a clearer vision of truth, specifically a vision of truth that has been drained of the pathological human distortions originating in the self-interest of the ego. Afterward, one will listen to morning prayers, followed by performing one's worldly duties before ending the day with more recitation and remembering the Lord's name. Even if one does not know anything about the religion of Sikhism, one will probably still be familiar with certain traits of the Sikh's physical appearance. All of these physical traits are, though, symbolic of deeper religious meanings. The Sikh's long hair, for example, symbolizes saintly behavior, while the Sikh's undergarment symbolizes self-control. The steel bangles symbolize refraining from theft, adultery, or other unethical acts. The Sikh's comb symbolizes purity, and the Sikh's sword symbolizes fearlessness, determination, and will. Because Sikhism describes God as the one who is formless, eternal, infinite, all-pervading, absolute, and beyond comprehension by the human mind, it has been argued that the Sikh teachings overlap with the deepest truth of the ancient Vedas. The biggest difference, perhaps, between these two disclosures of the same truth is that everyone without exception can understand the Sikh version, whereas the Vedas are basically inaccessible to anyone who lacks fluency in Sanskrit or who has not been initiated into the priestly and scholarly social circles in which knowledge about the Vedas has been passed down from teacher to student. Sikhism places so great an emphasis on social equality because, from the perspective of the Sikh, social reconciliation, or forgiveness as it's usually called, is not just the symbol of God. Forgiveness 
is God, which is interestingly the same conclusion which Hegel arrived at near the end of Phenomenology of Spirit. You may recall in that book, the chapter on religion only begins after spirit had evolved from the individual conscience of the beautiful soul to the first religious community in which I forgive the other precisely because they do not deserve that forgiveness, with the properly edible realization that the person on this earth who is so sinful that he could never deserve the other's forgiveness is just me, myself. Well, Sikhism's radical emphasis on social reconciliation is what has led it to recognize truth in all religions. Guru Nanak really put his money where his mouth is in terms of revering all religions in that he famously visited the holy sites of Hindus and also made pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, wearing the blue garments of a Turk while doing so. He composed poetry in Persian, but also studied the Vedas in Sanskrit. The Guru's uniqueness as a religious reformer, though, lay in his decision to not take the naive path of just trying to create an artificial synthesis of Islam and Hinduism, the two main religions of his uh, time and place within history, in order to try to appeal to both communities in a superficial manner. This is something which one Mughal emperor apparently did do, according to Shashi Tharoor's book, The Hindu Way. But in stark contrast, the guru simply encouraged people to live their own religions more truthfully. The guru never demanded any Hindu or Muslim to convert to Sikhism, but instead asked them to just live their own religions more sincerely by practicing their religious ideals rather than just paying lip service to them. No matter which religion was under consideration, the guru downplayed exterior forms such as ritualism as empty by contrasting it with a sincere living, which was more valuable because it concerned the interior realm of the self. Similarly, the guru opposed the practice of repeating pre-written prayers in any religion, because in reality, somebody can do that and still allow his or her mind to wander away to mundane daily concerns at the moment one is supposed to be thinking about God. Once again, getting the exterior form right is not good enough in Sikhism. For just the same reason, he opted out of the false dichotomy of either using the Sanskrit language of Hinduism or the Persian language of the Mughals by instead favoring the vernacular Punjabi languages of the common people of his area, in much the same way that Martin Luther had done in his own reformation of Christianity in Germany at about the same time in history. Even in terms of rhythm, it has been observed that the guru's poetry tended to resemble the sound of the folk songs and ballads of the common people. The guru's rejection of elitist exclusions was also exemplified in his decision to reject the advice of people within his own community in the construction of the Golden Temple. They told him to build it on the highest hill in town, as so many other religious sites would have had done for them, but the guru instead chose a low elevation within the town for the site's construction. This decision reflected his view on the symbolic value of humility, but also served an important practical function by allowing universal access to the temple, a temple which he ordered to be open on all four sites in order to prevent any discrimination of entry. But while we're on the topic of the Sikh Guru's relations with the Mughal Empire, we have to acknowledge that these were complicated and varied from emperor to emperor and from guru to guru. One Mughal emperor was described as having made a pilgrimage to Amritsar to seek the guru's blessing in person, which the guru, of course, gladly gave. Another emperor invited a later guru to a tiger hunt in the forest. During the hunt, the emperor was allegedly attacked by the tiger and the guards who attempted to shoot it failed to land any arrow or bullet on the animal. No one had the courage to actually approach the tiger in hand-to-hand -hand combat except the Sikh guru himself, who allegedly rushed in with the sword and slew the tiger, risking his own life to save that of the emperor. Such peaceful relations were not to last, though. Another Mughal emperor ordered the martyrdom of Guru Arjan on bogus charges of blasphemy after he refused to modify the Sikh scriptures 
on grounds that their revelation of the truth was not open to his or anyone else's arbitrary modifications. But even as Guru Arjan famously accepted his unjust martyrdom in a non-violent manner by treating it as the will of God, a clear message was still imparted to his successors that they must take up the sword and actively defend themselves in an inevitable battle against the forces of intolerance and narrow-mindedness. From here on, the Guru's successor would always have an army, and the Sikh tradition of warriors would lead each Hindu family in the Punjab region to traditionally raise one of their sons as a Sikh so that he would go on to be a warrior. To this day, Sikhs in India are still allowed to carry a sword in a nation that otherwise has a ban on the possession of weapons. For various reasons, battles between Sikh and Mughal forces happened over the years, but the Sikhs proved themselves to be courageous and skilled warriors who time and again defeated the forces of the Emperor. Whereas modern conditions might mislead one to think that all violence whatsoever is inherently immoral, Sikhism allowed for the nuance to see that nonviolence is only a virtue if it is practiced by those who are courageous, if nonviolence is simply used in a, as an excuse for one's own cowardice or helplessness, it is itself a vice. Sikhism's emphasis on heroic courage was taken to an extreme when one guru gathered many young men together and then demanded a Sikh to sacrifice himself by offering up his head. After some time, one brave man agreed to sacrifice himself and followed the guru into a tent in which the crowd then heard a sword fall and saw the guru emerge from the tent with blood dripping from his weapon. But one sacrifice was not to be enough. The guru demanded another, then another, and another, until a total of six young men had agreed to sacrifice themselves. As some of the men began to flee the gathering, believing that the guru had gone mad, at that moment, the six men emerged from the tent and revealed that the slaughtered victims had really been six goats. In addition to being a test of courage, this was a test for one's willingness to sacrifice oneself for the sake of higher ideals and for the love of one's community. With the passing of Guru Gobind Singh later on, the guru of Sikhism would no longer be present as a physical person on earth. Instead, the teachings were understood to be present in the scriptures and accessible to anyone willing to study them. For this reason, to this day, Sikhs revere the scriptures by prostrating before the book each morning and offering prayers to it. So this will conclude our first video on the philosophy of Sikhism. I hope to have many more discussions of the topic. I'm very interested to hear your opinions and suggestions in the comments section of this video. Thank you very much.